Welcome everybody to the Philosophy Garden. In the Philosophy Garden, we think about interesting issues, starting from short videos produced by experts for everyone. You may be wondering who we are. Mostly, we are a group of philosophers based at the University of Birmingham who like to think that their own research and the research of experts worldwide is important when we try to understand a lot of the issues that we worry about in our society. And thus, we are collecting and producing resources that enable teachers and educators to introduce in the classroom a lot of interesting issues that young people can reflect about and discuss. My name is Lisa Bortolotti and I'm a philosopher of psychology. Kathleen Murphy Hollis and Jessica Sutherland have worked with me either to create or to promote and deliver the resources that I will be talking about. And our inspiration has been Dr. Anne Kino at the University of Milan, who is also a philosopher and is one of the founders of the Philosophy Museum at the University of Milan. What we want to do is promote a better understanding of timely and complex phenomena on the basis of interdisciplinary research that sometimes can be presented as difficult to access. So we want to help educators and young people to access research that is relevant to everyday thinking and decision making by creating resources that are fun, easy to use and free. Our mission is to bring philosophical analysis and critical skills to bear on everyday life and also to help solve some problems that we have in our society. For instance, the problem that polarization threatens public participation in decision making. We also want to encourage creative responses to these problems and we think young people are the best ones to be creative and think about effective solutions to these problems. When it comes to conspiracy theories and misinformation, which is the focus of the resources that I will be describing today, there are two main questions that we want to address. Why is it that we find conspiracy theories attractive? And if we end up accepting a conspiracy theory, are we doing anything wrong? Is it just the case that we happen to endorse an explanation that mainstream sources reject? Or have we committed a mistake? Maybe we have evaluated the evidence in the wrong way. All of these issues are extremely relevant to thinking skills curriculum because we will be talking and thinking about how we gather data, how we assess different sources of information, how we judge the relevance of information to a specific problem, what biases and fallacies we might exhibit in our reasoning, how we evaluate evidence, how we draw conclusions from the evidence that we've gathered, and how we construct our own argument and analyze other arguments. Now, the main resource that we want to focus on is the explainer video. The explainer video is a very short animated video whose main purpose is to explain a concept. Now we find that the explainer video is especially suited to kickstart philosophical discussion because it works a little bit like the classic Aesop fable. I'm sure you're all familiar with some Aesop fables like the ant and the grasshopper. Those are very short fairy tale, fairy tale type stories that feature animal characters talking to each other and interacting with each other in a specific environment. What is special about Aesop fables is that they always end with a message for the audience, which suggests a way in which they should behave in the future, given how the story went. So there are three features of Aesop fables that make them quite suitable for a young audience. 
As stories, they're brief and engaging, so they're absolutely to the point. And the fact that they feature animal characters makes them appealing even to young children. Because they're really short, there is no plot or character development, but there is a concrete problem to be solved or a decision to be made. So there is something to focus the attention that is quite practical. And finally, because there is an interpretation at the end, a message that is given to the audience, um, there is also some kind of indication of how we should behave in the future. Now, we don't think that this should always be accepted without critical engagement. It may be that we don't agree with the message of the story, but the fact that there is a message out there makes it easier for us to engage with the meaning of the story and to think about whether the message is appropriate. How does it work? How can we use a short animated video in the classroom to make young people think about important issues? This is just a suggestion, but we could start just by watching the video and asking students to think about some aspects of it, either by themselves or in small groups. Then we could explore some ideas that emerge from this initial discussion and supplement the video with other resources, very short talks by experts, online articles written by, the general, written by experts for the general public, testimonies and handouts with information. Now, of course, this can be a cycle it may be that we watch the video the first time and we focus on one particular aspect and then we watch the video a second time and we focus on a different aspect. This means that although the video is very short, um, the kind of information that we find in it is layered so it can appeal to people from different groups and people of different ages. It may be that younger children just follow the main um, events in the story and have comments about the characters featuring in it, but it may also be that um, teenagers are instead more interested in the things that we don't actually see in the story and we need to assume what the motivations are for the characters to act in a certain way, what the consequences are of the characters' actions. Without further ado, let me introduce one of these videos that we have produced on the philosophy and psychology of conspiracy theories. How do conspiracy theories take hold? Our supply of seeds is gone. It's a disaster. This trail of seeds leads to Beetle. He must have taken our seeds. Don't jump to conclusions. How can you be so sure that it was Beetle? We haven't gathered enough clues yet. Spider, what do you think? Grasshopper's theory makes sense. Yesterday, Beetle was ogling your seeds. He must have decided to steal them in the night. Today, your seeds are gone, and now he's fast asleep. Grasshopper's theory makes sense. I give you that, Spider. But looking at all these leaves off the branches, and the nests fallen on the ground? Isn't it more likely that the strong wind last night scattered our seeds around? Grasshopper, you are stuck. When you can't stand the uncertainty, you may be tempted by an intriguing story. A story that is simple and coherent and points to someone else as the villain. When we do not know how a new virus emerged, we may speculate that evil scientists created it in their lab. But we should wait and gather more evidence. Because once we commit to a theory, it is difficult to give it up. How do con I hope you liked our video, The Ant and the Grasshopper. Here are some examples of questions that can be asked to guide reflection or discussion in the classroom. We can ask what makes Grasshopper's explanation 
different, maybe worse, um, than aunt's explanation. We can observe how both aunt and grasshopper are searching for clues. This is very interesting because um, people who endorse the conspiracy theories are interested in explaining events just like everybody else. So at the bottom, there is this desire to make sense of reality. So how does Grasshopper's investigation differ from Ant's investigation? Also, there are some aspects of the videos that are a little bit less explicit. Uh, we see at the end that Grasshopper gets stuck um, to the spider web. What can this mean? It may be interesting for students to talk about what this being stuck uh, means in the case of Grasshopper. Now, of course, this is just the starting point to introduce some maybe expert research or expert literature that is relevant to these issues. How sometimes, especially when we are stressed and we are experiencing something that is upsetting for us, grasshopper just lost his supply of seeds, we tend to jump to conclusions. We, we tend to find an explanation that we are happy with before we've gathered all the necessary evidence. Or we may be thinking about how we have this tendency to think that events that precede another event may be causally related to that event. So for instance, in the video, it seems to be that the spider believes that Beetle um, was likely to have stolen the seeds just because he was sleeping as if you know, he had had a good meal the night before. But the fact that beetle is sleeping doesn't seem to be immediately causally related to the disappearance of the seeds. So you see that you can talk about biases, which sometimes can be a conversation that is quite abstract and complex by using um, concrete examples from the video. Also, there are blog posts and online articles in the Philosophy Garden that can expand uh, the students' horizons. Um, in this example, uh, Anna Aikino and I wrote an article for the conversation on whether conspiracy theories should be seen as irrational. Um, there is a link to that and to other similar resources in the Philosophy Garden. Let me introduce another video, The Fox and the Owl. Why do conspiracy theories trump other explanations? I've noticed a few strange things. The river is drying up, lots of trees fall and die, and strange noises come from the edge of the forest. It seems it's only me who has noticed all these things. A monster must be behind all of this, a big, scary giant who drinks up all the water in the river, stops it reaching the forest and stomps on our trees. Owl, I figured out what is happening all by myself. Luckily, I am here to look out for everybody. But Fox, I haven't seen any monster, have you? When I was flying, I saw some strange machines at the edge of the forest though. Why don't we go and investigate this together? Or ask Beaver, who lives on the river, whether she knows anything. Why would we do that? It is a waste of time. I have already solved the mystery. With your theory, Fox, you want everybody to realise how smart and independent you are and how much you care about the forest. This is just like people who claimed that the coronavirus was a hoax and flouted government guidelines who described themselves as defending personal freedoms. Or people who describe their denial of climate change as a sign that they can think for themselves. We all like stories that make us look good and unique, but Working together can lead us closer to the truth. Why? I hope you like the second video. Here again are some questions that can help guide discussion or reflection. How does Fox feel about his explanation for the changes in the forest? Why is it the fox dismisses Owl's alternative hypothesis? Why does he decide that it's not worth asking Beaver? You see that a lot of the features of the potential conspiracy theory that 
kind of the explanation that is considered to be the minority view explanation are similar uh, to those that we saw in the previous video. But here the focus is more on the lack of collaboration and the fact that the fox sees himself as special and unique for having this explanation and doesn't really want to recognize expertise that comes um, from consulting with other people, um, other forest creatures in this case, who might have uh, more information because of the way in which they live or simply because of the experiences that they had. Finally, you know, you can also ask questions about how it is that we come to know that um, Fox is wrong about the forest or that Owl is right. I mean, um, we can introduce questions about truth and evidence and now, you know, even having evidence for a certain explanation doesn't guarantee that the explanation will be true, will be the correct one. Again, we can point to uh, literature on the philosophy and psychology of conspiracy theories, and in particular, how we know that the attraction of conspiracy theories sometimes lies in certain needs that we have. We need to feel in control of the situation. We need to feel that we know what is going on. We need an explanation straight away, because otherwise we become too stressed by what is happening around us, especially if what is happening is significant to us. Um, we also want to feel good about ourselves. We want to feel that we are the one who um, manages to solve the mystery or manages to help uh, other people. Um, so sometimes uh, the desire to endorse a, a non-mainstream explanation comes from a feeling that we want to be better that we want to be good. In the philosophy garden, you find some helpful handouts that you can print uh, either in color or in black and white, where the biases, the psychological needs and other factors contributing to um, conspiracy theories are described very simply and very briefly with a slogan and an example and an icon that helps these biases, needs, and other factors be easily recognizable. I want to talk to you about our attempts at presenting these resources to young people. And in particular, I want to talk about three different contexts um, in which we have shown the videos to um, children and young people of different ages. Catherine Murphy Hollis, who is a philosopher at the University of Birmingham, has participated last summer in the National Access Summer School, and she has led a session on the philosophy and conspiracy, um, on philosophy and conspiracy theories for year 12 students. So here we're talking about young people of 16 uh, to 17 years old. Students were very eager and receptive. Uh, to share their thoughts on the conspiracy theories that they had encountered when Kathleen asked them to at the beginning of the session and they talked about what their friends believed or what they found on social media. And then with Kathleen, they discussed some philosophical questions about conspiracy theories. What counts as a conspiracy theory, why people might adopt conspiracy theories and whether people who adopt conspiracy theories can be said to be rational. In Kathleen's session, the focus was on cognitive biases, which are associated with conspiracy theories. And according to Kathleen, the video were quite useful in demonstrating what these biases are and what role they play in uh, facilitating beliefs in conspiracy theories. Kathleen reports that by the end of the session, students have broken down some of the most bizarre conspiracy theories they had encountered into more familiar individual and environmental factors that can give rise to the formation and the spreading of conspiracy theories. Jessica Sutherland addressed a slightly younger audience. She had a 45 minute session twice with year 10 students. These are uh, 14 to 15 year olds. She delivered an interactive session based around the videos and the worksheets, the handouts that I've shown you. 
encouraging work both in pairs and in groups. She reports the students were very engaged and really enjoyed linking the concepts back to the conspiracy theories they already knew about. She also thinks that it was quite fun for her to be able to teach philosophy in this way, using everyday examples to explain deeper ideas. Jessica talked to a teacher who participated in the session and the teacher compared this interactive outreach session to more traditional lecture style outreach sessions that are common at Unifest. And the teacher noted that students were much more engaged in the interactive section, session because they had an opportunity to participate. Um, they also observed that the videos help structure the session and allow Jessica to steer the discussion back to philosophical concepts, such as cognitive biases and the nature of truth. Finally, Jessica mentioned that there was some kind of evolution in the course of the uh, session. So at the beginning, when she was asking students whether they thought philosophy would be useful to address a number of problems in everyday life, students were not sure, they expressed doubts. But at the end of the session, they went back to this question and students said that they could see the value that there is in thinking about these ideas and asking whether we're interacting with the world in the right way. Finally, um, the third context in which the videos were shown um, to young people uh, is in a primary school. So we're very grateful to teacher Francesca Whitelock um, at King Sutton Primary School, who presented the videos to her audience, which was a mixed age class, um, year four and five, so the ages from eight to 10. There were some students with um, special educational needs among uh, this group. Initially, children were asked what truth is, and they discussed how sometimes it is okay not to tell the truth to spare people's feelings. They also talk about faith and trust. Um, sometimes we just need to believe what people tell us because we have no way of checking whether what they tell us is true. Children also discussed the difference between believing and experiencing and talked about how sometimes seeing is believing. It's much easier to believe something that you have witnessed yourself. And they talked about fictional characters such as unicorns, fairies, and even Harry Potter. They also considered the notions of reliability in science experiments, because apparently that's something that they had uh, worked on in science. And they focused on truth as a concept that may be useful in understanding the videos that they were going to watch. Then they watch the videos, posing them at certain points to facilitate discussion and reflection. Um, they saw three videos, but we're just going to talk about the two videos that you have also seen. Um, for the ant and the grasshopper, children really seem to like the animation, uh, how kind of the story works out, uh, the pictures, the detail in the pictures, um, also, the wildlife theme was something that they appreciated, the difference in opinion among the animals. Um, some children found um, aspects of the story a little bit scary. Um, so the fact that the grasshopper gets stuck at the end or the spider's eyes were a little bit scary, um, which is interesting because it shows a high level of engagement with the story and the details of the story. For the fox and the owl, um, there were some kind of uh, strong feelings against the fox. Um, the fact that the fox should have known better, should have used um, his imagination, um, should have uh, interacted with other animals more in the forest. Um, the children really seem to like the owl. They seem to like the message in the story, the ideas in the story. Um, and also the presence of humans at the end was something that they appreciated. So overall, there were lots of opinions about um, the story itself and I was communicating a message. Francesca told us that uh, she had to show the videos in one session. Um, there was a time constraint, it was the end of term. 
But if she uh, were to do it again, then she'd show the videos on different days, maybe even different weeks, associating certain tasks to each video so that reflections can be more focused. She also thought that there should be quite a good introduction to the videos, especially for younger learners. Uh, key terms and vocabulary should be explained. For instance, cognitive bias may be quite a difficult um, idea that needs breaking up. Um, also, she commented how she thought that the ideas presented in the videos were useful for the social, emotional and mental health curriculum and the personal, social, health and economic education curriculum, which is very um, good for us to hear. So to conclude, uh, this is what the philosophy garden is about is gathering the sources that can be used um, for um, the classroom uh, apart from the videos as i already hinted there will be um, on the philosophy garden online articles uh, links to uh, short talks by experts and also with information that we have created but also links to interactive educational games that are already available online um, and that uh, children can play to compete with one another, to test their understanding, and just to have some fun. The site does encourage people to be creative. It invites uh, young people to script their own explainer video, to engage with existing material, to suggest new material, and there is a feedback form that is very easy to engage with and that will enable us to know what we need to do better in the philosophy garden to make the resources even more accessible and engaging this is a bit of the kind of look of the philosophy garden there are these characters in a kind of garden setting either the forest or the playground or the picnic area and they talk to each other about the stories and finally, uh, this is an example of some of the games that we link to. This is a game that invites people to think about how to spread misinformation and how we can avoid being taken in by information that is not reliable. And this is a game created by two psychologists based in the UK, um, Daniel Jolly and Karen Douglas, called The Conspiracy Kitchen, where they give you some ingredients and you can build your own conspiracy theory. It is quite fun and easy to do even for younger children. And this is the look of our uh, expert talks. Um, we get people from different backgrounds, philosophers, psychiatrists, psychologists, social scientists, to talk for less than two minutes about conspiracy theories. So each of them develops one point. Um, and these videos can be uh, watched and talked about. Um, they are aimed at the general public. Sometimes they are a little bit challenging, but it's just an additional resource that can expand knowledge. And finally, we have room in the philosophy garden for links and events so that people can engage even more with our resources. Here is our website, www.thephilosophygarden.com. We have an Instagram account called The Philosophy Garden where we post updates. So if we create a new video um, or if there is new information available on the website or a new event that we're organizing in person, then um, we will have a post on Instagram. And for people who don't uh, use social media, we all can also be contacted easily by email and we can provide information about our resources there. There is a lot of help for teachers on uh, the site itself, for instance, the handouts that can be printed, which I mentioned before. And all is left for me to do is to thank our sponsors that have contributed in different ways to um, uh, our capacity to create and promote these resources, the Royal Institute of Philosophy, um, the Philosophy Museum in Milan, the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and of course, the University of Birmingham. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation and I hope you will visit the Philosophy Garden very soon. Thank you.